Welcome to the Renaissance Spirit. Greetings, dear friend. As I stand here before you, a man of Rome long consigned to dust, I am tasked with addressing a rather curious proposition. Would I, Marcus Tullius Cicero, find myself cancelled in your modern age? Though such a question might perplex an ancient mind like mine, it also piques my curiosity. I, whose words once swayed the Senate, who spoke truth to power, now stand in your public court of opinion. In this trial, by posterity, I shall unmask myself before you and consider whether my virtues, or as some may deem them, my vices, would survive your world's scrutiny. I was outspoken on the dangers of tyranny. I spoke out against the actions of Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, and that outspokenness cost me my life at the orders of Mark Antony. Would I do it again? Most certainly. I believed in Rome and civic virtue, and to my mind, civitas and civic virtues are the very foundation of a healthy republic. Without it, no laws, no institutions, no magistrates, however wise or powerful, can preserve the fabric of the state. A true citizen must cultivate not only knowledge of the laws and customs, but also an unwavering dedication to the common good. In our decisions, reason must guide us, for it is through reason discourse that the light of truth emerges. Yet reason alone is not enough. It must be tempered with compassion. For to rule justly, one must understand the needs of the people and the human condition. A mind informed by study and reflection, a heart moved by humanity, and a soul devoted to the Republic, these are the pillars of civic virtue. When we act with these virtues, we rise above the temptations of ambition and the clamor of the crowd, seeking always the welfare of our fellow citizens and the eternal glory of the res publica. Ah, yes, I hear the accusations already. Cicero, ever the rabble-rouser, forever condemning the mighty while clinging to power in the Senate. My Philippics against Antony? Vitriol, they say. My denunciations of Caesar? Treachery. Yet, I ask you, would you have me remain silent? When the very foundations of our republic trembled beneath the ambitions of a man who sought to crown himself king, was I to lay down my quill? No. I stood because the republic, our shared civitas, demanded it. In your time, those who speak boldly against corruption find themselves assailed by two camps, those who cling to the tyrant's coattails and those who fear the consequence of truth. You may call it divisive. I call it necessary. Had I not spoken, Rome would have suffered an even swifter demise. And in your age, would you truly silence those who challenge authority? If so, I suspect your republic, like mine, is in graver danger than you know. There are those among you who would balk at my defense of the aristocracy, for I have no shame in declaring that the Republic must be stewarded by men of reason and experience. Ah, but now I hear the cries of injustice. Elitism, you shout. And yet, let me ask you this. Would you trust the state to those who neither understand its workings nor respect its laws. In my day, the balance between the Senate and the people was delicate, fragile as a porcelain vessel. Do you not struggle with this same balance today? You speak of the will of the people, yet I see great divides within your own lands. It is not the aristocracy of birth I defended, but the aristocracy of virtue. I championed a republic where men of wisdom guide the state, not tyrants or demagogues. In this I do not recant. Though I might stand accused of clinging to power, I tell you that power was only ever wielded in service to the Republic, not in service to myself. Would you cancel me for this defense? Then perhaps your Republic has confused equality with anarchy. Ah, now we arrive at a delicate matter slavery, that dark blot on our history, upon which our very empire was built. I shall not pretend otherwise. In truth, slavery was woven into the fabric of Rome, 
and like many of my contemporaries, I did little to untangle its threads. Was I complicit in this? Perhaps I was not an abolitionist in your modern sense, nor did I ever question the institution that sustained our society. And yet, I hear you cry out in condemnation, and rightly so. In your age, you have come to see the grave injustice of this practice, and in this, I admire your progress. But I ask you, would you dismiss me outright for a sin I never recognized as such? Or would you permit me to stand before you, flaws and all, and still have my other teachings heard? I do not claim moral perfection, but I do claim a lifelong devotion to the cause of justice. Even if my understanding of justice was incomplete, would you cancel me for this failure? I leave that judgment to you, but know this, our pursuit of virtue is always an evolution, and I too was shaped by the blind spots of my time. In this first part of my defense, I have revealed the heart of my political convictions and my entanglements with the harsh realities of Roman governance. But as we journey onward, dear friend, I will lay bare more my views on women, nationalism, and the stoic resolve that may too easily be misinterpreted in your modern world. I ask only that you continue with me and judge not in haste, but with the deliberation befitting a true student of Civitas. Ah, women, even in my day, the question of their place in the world was a topic for hushed discussions and private musings. I hear your criticism already. Cicero, a man of his time, held views that would be dismissed as patriarchal or even misogynistic today. Let me not skirt this issue. I admit, the Rome in which I lived did not grant women the liberties and equal standing that your society now seems to demand. But remember this, my friends, my actions, my writings, and my philosophy were always shaped by the world in which I found myself. Would you truly fault me for being a product of that age? I spoke little of women, not because I dismissed them, but because their role in civic life was limited by the customs of our society. Women were bound by the household, men by the Senate, and the courts. You might say I upheld this separation of spheres, and you would be right. But before you raise your hand to strike me down for these views, I ask, how much of your modern world remains divided still? Do you not struggle for equality today? Would you cancel me for failing to champion a cause that was beyond my grasp in the Roman context? Speaking of your modern context, as I discuss in my other videos, Kamala Harris has been a virtuous public servant for decades, and I endorse her run for president. But I presume that some of you would not vote for her because she is a woman. That, my dear friends, is one definition of misogyny. No doubt in your age, I would be asked to account for these silences and for my failure to push the boundaries further. I cannot claim foresight, but I can claim honesty. I did not seek to oppress, but to preserve the Republic, and my actions, rightly or wrongly, were guided by that singular vision. My omission of women in civic discourse was not a deliberate slight, but a reflection of what Rome was, not what it could be. Will you hold me to the impossible standard of seeing through the veil of centuries? Or will you allow me the same grace you afford to other men of history, flawed but sincere? Now let us turn to a matter more central to my being, my unwavering loyalty to Rome. It has been said that I was a nationalist, a man who saw Rome as the pinnacle of human achievement. To this charge, I do not plead innocence, for I truly believed that Roman governance, culture, and law were superior to the ways of the so-called barbarians. Rome was a land of migrants from the very beginning, a home to all peoples of different colors and religions, and it was the multiculturalism and shared respect for the state and civic duty of all our peoples that won my heart and mind. I was not an ethnocentrist, 
a man blind to the worth of other peoples and cultures. But tell me, is it wrong to love one's homeland? Is it wrong to believe in the excellence of the society to which one has given their life? In your modern age, the idea of nationalism is often met with disdain, seen as narrow-minded and destructive. But remember, dear friend, my nationalism was not born of hatred for others, but of love for Rome. Rome was not just a city. It was an ideal, a beacon of civitas, of civic duty, and of law. And yes, I believed in the superiority of that ideal, just as many of you believe in the superiority of democracy or human rights today. But would this belief lead to my cancellation? Yet, I would argue that my loyalty to Rome was born from a deep sense of responsibility, not arrogance. If you, in your age, dismiss such loyalty as outdated, then I fear you may not understand the true weight of civic duty. You, too, must guard against those who would erode the foundations of your society. In this, we are not so different, are we? And now, we reach the heart of my philosophy. I was an academic skeptic with the stoic resolve that shaped my life and my politics. As an adherent to the teachings of the academia, I, Marcus Tullius Cicero, found much wisdom in the skeptical tradition. This path, forged by the likes of Arcesilaus and Carneades, embraces the understanding that absolute certainty is beyond the reach of mortal men. The gods may see with clarity, but we must settle for that which is most probable. This skepticism does not compel one to abandon truth, but rather to accept that human knowledge is frail, prone to error, and ever-changing. In this way, I found a greater freedom in both philosophical inquiry and in the governance of our res publica. For in matters of law and politics, one must navigate shifting tides and intricate debates. Here, it is not the rigid certainties of the Stoics or Epicureans that serve best, but the flexibility of judgment that academic skepticism offers. To weigh all arguments, to examine them with care, and to act upon that which seems most reasonable at the moment that, to me, was the wisest course. In this manner, I could defend the Republic, debate with my peers, and yet never be enslaved by dogma. Instead, I pursued the path of reason, acknowledging that while we may never possess perfect knowledge, we must strive always for the best judgment we can attain. While I accepted some Stoic ideals, I was not a Stoic per se. I often hear murmurs in your time that my Stoicism would be viewed as callous, unfeeling. You live in an age where emotions are openly discussed, where trauma is acknowledged, and where personal feelings are validated in public discourse. I admire your society's progress, but I ask, is my philosophy truly incompatible with this? My belief was never that one should ignore suffering, but that one must rise above it. To endure is not to dismiss hardship, but to overcome it with dignity. You may accuse me of being detached, perhaps even uncaring by your standards. I would argue the opposite. Stoicism and skepticism for me was a means of survival. When the Republic crumbled around me, when tyranny loomed, it was stoicism that allowed me to persist, to act, and to speak, even when the consequences were dire. I ask you this, would you cancel me for preaching resilience? for urging men and women to bear the trials of life with grace and fortitude. In your age of comfort and excess, perhaps stoicism seems harsh, but in a world of endless change, where institutions falter and tyranny rises again, my message of endurance, of personal responsibility, remains as relevant as ever. Stoicism is not a cold philosophy. It is the warm embrace of reality the shield that allows the spirit to weather the storms of fate. Would you truly cast this aside? In this second part of my defense, I have presented my case on matters of gender, nationalism, and stoic philosophy. 
These two may seem like points of contention for you in the modern age, but before you pass judgment, I implore you to consider the wisdom that lies beneath these ideas. Soon, I shall draw my final conclusions and demonstrate why, far from being cancelled, my voice and my truths are indispensable to the modern age. So, we come to the heart of the matter, my own philosophical bedrock, and one that I believe you, in the modern age, misunderstand. You see, in your time, compassion is exalted. You speak of empathy, mental health, and emotional expression as virtues to be celebrated. In my time, we too knew suffering perhaps more acutely, as the Roman world was harsh and unyielding. Yet, we responded to suffering not with an outpouring of emotion, but with a firm resolve to endure. You may interpret this as coldness, but I assure you, it is the very opposite. When tyranny pressed down on the Roman Republic, it was not my stoicism that caused suffering. It was my stoicism that allowed me to act in the face of it. When I lost my beloved daughter, Tullia, I grieved as any man would, but I did not allow grief to paralyze me. I sought solace not in external comforts, but in the strength of the mind. I tell you, dear friend, this philosophy of endurance is not meant to crush the human spirit, but to elevate it. In your world, where individuals are often overwhelmed by anxiety and despair, would you truly cast aside a philosophy that teaches resilience? You see, stoicism is not about ignoring pain, but about mastering it. And as your own world teeters on the edge of uncertainty, whether through political turmoil, environmental disaster, or social division, I submit that the teachings of endurance are more needed now than ever. So, would you cancel me for urging strength, for urging calm, in the face of chaos? I hope not, for in the long march of time, those who endure are the ones who shape history. And so, we come to the final question, would I, Marcus Tullius Cicero, be cancelled today? I have stood before you and addressed the charges. My political outspokenness, my defense of the aristocracy, my silence on slavery, my attitudes toward women, my nationalism, and my stoicism, each, by your modern standards, could be viewed as grounds for dismissal. And yet, I stand unshaken. Why? Because beneath these perceived flaws lies a deeper truth, one that transcends time. My philosophy, my civitas, was always rooted in the belief that a society must be built on justice, virtue, and the shared responsibility of its citizens. You, in your age, face challenges, not unlike those I faced in Rome. Corruption, tyranny, the erosion of civic values, these are not the relics of the past, they are the struggles of today. And it is precisely for this reason that my voice must be heard, not silenced. I do not claim to be perfect, no man is. But I do claim that the principles I fought for, the virtues I espoused, are as vital today as they were in Rome. To cancel me would be to reject the very essence of civic virtue to abandon the pursuit of justice in favor of comfort. You see, the strength of a republic lies not in avoiding difficult conversations or erasing uncomfortable histories, but in confronting them with wisdom and resolve. That is what I offer you, a path forward, not backward. And it is for this reason that I would not and should not be canceled. But before I depart, I wish to speak to you not just as Cicero, but as a voice within a larger movement, the Renaissance spirit. This is more than a mere channel. It is a beacon for those who seek to reignite the flame of civic participation and engagement. You see, the Renaissance spirit is dedicated to pursuing a just, equitable, and humanitarian world. It speaks to those who dare to delve into the liberal arts and sciences to examine the ancient world Rome and beyond as a mirror for the present. 
In this age of digital noise and distraction, the Renaissance spirit calls you back to the golden age of knowledge, to the pursuit of truth, both lost to time and yet to be discovered. Just as the Renaissance gave birth to the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason, so too does this movement seek to awaken minds, to inspire individuals to embrace learning, compassion, and an understanding of our shared humanity. For only through knowledge can we become better stewards of the Earth and of each other. The Renaissance spirit is not just a philosophy, it is a style for living, a way of growing, thinking, and contributing to society. So, I implore you, dear friend, join us, subscribe, share, and engage with the material. Take part in this movement, for history has not died, only our understanding of it has. And together, we shall revive the spirit of learning, of justice, and of civic virtue. Vive Renaissance Spiritus! Thank you.